The Minnesota School of the Air presents People Worth Hearing About, a special impact series spotlighting the lives of outstanding American Indians. Today's outstanding Indian personality is Lee Brightman. Here is a portion of an interview with Mr. Brightman in which he discussed present Indian education. Mr. Brightman is the Director of Indian Affairs at the University of California. The program opens with the interviewer referring to a meeting Mr. Brightman had had a day earlier with Mr. Bruce, Director of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. Do you recall some of the things you asked him last night, some of his replies? Well, I asked him why they weren't helping Indians gain higher education. Right now, oh, less than one per, well, about 1% of Indian, the Indian people gradu uh, graduate from college. And we have the lowest educational uh, level of education in the United States. The average Indian only completes the fifth grade. And there are between, six, there are 16,000 Indians that aren't in school, Indian students, between the ages of 8 and 16. And this has been brought about uh, through the alienation of the school system and American Indian. And by this, they used to take our Indian kids at the age of six. In fact, they still do. They take our Indian kids at the age of six and put them in these prison-like institutions. They're not uh, run like schools. They have bed checks on them of a night. They check them when they wake up in the morning. They march them to and from classes. They give them 30 minutes to eat in some places. They don't let them take showers uh, in the evenings in some places. They don't let boys and girls hold hands. If they catch them holding hands, they give them five hours of uh, work. Oh. Like we went over to university, uh, not not university, but uh, Stewart Institute in Nevada. And they have a rule there, boys and girls can't hold hands, high school students now. High school students can't hold hands there. And if they catch them, they give them five hours, uh, five dem demerits. It's about an hour of demerit that you have to work off. And if they catch you with your arm around a girl, it's 20 demerits. They give them 30 minutes to eat, and they can't go back for seconds. They don't let them take showers in the morning, just in the afternoon, and not after 7.30 in the evening. And they had a special square, getting back to this holding hands, they had a special square marked off where boys and girls could hold hands for one hour a day. And they had a woman with a whistle who blew the whistle at 5 o'clock, and they could hold hands between 4 and 5. After that, no more holding hands. They also, th at this particular school, they had five young Indian girls who ran away from school, and they cut all of their hair off. Gave them, uh, they had waist-length hair and they cut their hair off like a man's. Can you imagine the emotional shock this would uh, bring about to a young Indian girl? They, they, they. They, the, 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 they. the teachers, the administrators who run this school at Stewart Institute. My organization, United Native Americans, went in and we exposed this. We took a reporter with us and uh, we exposed it. We went down to Sherman Institute, which is located at Riverside, California. We heard that they were kicking Indians around there. Sherman Institute has 800 Indian students. And out of 800 Indian students, they had an appropriations cut last year of $276,000. Now, due to the appropriations cut, they had to lop off 27 staff positions. 11 of these were teaching positions. And they still got the same amount of students, which means that the uh, teachers who were left had to assume these other positions, these jobs. Now, they had eight buildings that were condemned due to the earthquake authorities. They said the buildings were so old and dilapidated they were unsafe. So they condemned eight buildings. One of them was a gymnasium. They had no gym gymnasium to practice basketball in. One of them was a laboratory for the science class. So they had no lab uh, laboratory for science and chemistry. They're holding classes in their living quarters, classes in their living quarters. And they feed three meals a day on 75 cents. Job Corps feeds three meals a day on $1.56. Also at this school, they have shop equipment that is between 10 and 40 years old, 10 and 40. And at this particular school, they have one counselor, I think it's for about every 60 students. One counselor for every What's 60. the counselor's job? The counselor's supposed to talk to them and exp uh, just counsel them on problems and what have you. And how can one counselor uh, uh, counsel 60 students at uh, the, the, the schools themselves, where do the kids come from? These are BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding schools, and they come from different reservations. How many BIA boarding schools are there in America? I don't know the exact amount that they have, but of one-third of Indian children, are uh, of our students, are in 
board, uh, BIA boarding school. How early do they take an Indian? They take our kids sometimes at the age of five and uh, at six. Who determines that they'll take the kids? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. Why did, what are their criteria for taking a child from his parents or family? And I don't know the exact criteria, but they, uh, there was one article out that came out in, uh, the, new, in uh, the nation, and it was called Non-Indian Education for Indians. And at Tuba City, Arizona, they take Indian kids at the age of five and six and put them in these boarding schools. And when the parents come to see their children on alternate weekends, if the administrators feel that the, the conduct of the kids have been bad, is bad, they won't allow the parents to see their children. This can is a parents, city, Arizona. Can the parents take any recourse to get to see their kids? I don't know what recourse they actually have. These schools are controlled completely by non-Indians. This is one of the big gripes we've got. You take a typical Indian reservation school, it has a white man's name on it, not an Indian. Why not put a famous Indian on there rather than a famous white man? Then they need to hire Indian teachers. They need to hire Indian resource people, Indian teacher aides. They need to dress these schools up and put murals of uh, depicting Indian uh, 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 pictures and what have you, historical facts. They also uh, should uh, let Indians take part in formulating the curriculum of these schools. Indians don't sit on board meetings, school board meetings. They don't attend PTA meetings. They don't even let them uh, uh, go to the board meetings. They don't put them on the board. And these schools are not Indian schools, they're white schools, run by white people, and they're formed by white people. The curriculum that they use in our present BIA boarding schools, Bureau of Indian Affairs, these, school, these curriculums were formed by the dominant white middle class society in urban areas. I'm the director of the Indian Studies Program at University of California. We've got, a, we've got six courses we're teaching on Indians there. And when I came to this university, which is supposed to be the leading university in the United States, they know absolutely nothing about Indians, and each class I, uh, I enrolled in, once they found out I was an Indian, they'd ask me to tell them some, uh, something about Indians. They and I soon got tired of this, yes. Uh, you're tired of it. Tell me something about Indians. What I want to know is, I, I would like you to describe somewhat your opinion, your values. What, when we start teaching everybody about Indians, Indian kids and everybody else, yeah. the fact that the Indian built the Indian was here. The Indian's part of, of North America, yeah. whether we want to recognize it or not. And he still is. And as some groups say, he's not, we can do anything we want to, and we aren't going to, he's still part of, part of North America, right? Well, wh what are some examples of what lies back there before Columbus and since, since Columbus? Those things that aren't in the books, what should be there? Well, in, te in teaching Indian history and culture, they're going to, uh, this, this is another thing that's very hard to put down because uh, we, don't, we, we don't have any written records of what happened before uh, Columbus. And this is, uh, is going to be uh, a matter of sifting this out and with what available evidence there is. And our archaeologists and uh, what have you can, uh, this won't be that big a problem for them. In fact, they've done it. But the thing is, what we're trying to do right now is uh, bring about an awareness that Indians are here and we are, we're to, within, for instance, these Indian Studies programs that we've got started in some of the colleges and universities, we're trying to bring about, the con uh, show the American public what, uh, the contributions of American Indians, what we have contributed. And this will break down some of the mysteries and myths and racial barriers, uh, and well, it'll knock down the racial barriers by eliminating these myths, mysteries, and uh, fairy tales that have been created by a complete lack of knowledge about Indians. I think this will instill pride and confidence in Indians, and I think non-Indians will get a better image of Indians once they find out what they've contributed. People Worth Hearing About is planned under the supervision of Dwayne Dunkley, Indian Education Section, Minnesota State Department of Education, and Roger Kemp, teacher at the Pine Point School on the White Earth Reservation. Today's program has been written by Jane Katz, Produced by Irv Fink, with engineering by Martin Crowes. This has been a presentation of the Minnesota School of the Air.